Previous living on this channel is for educational purposes only. It is not intended as financial advice. It's Teaching Tech Tuesday. Let's take a look at some questions I've been getting, mainly regarding portfolio allocation for me personally. And this is why this entire video is going to come down to you as an individual watching this video. What is your plan? What do you want to do? I can tell you what I'm doing. I can tell you the path, the options that are available. But ultimately, it comes down to the individual. And I love the driving metaphor because if you're a defensive driver, you're always looking for things that could go wrong, ways you could avoid catastrophe, knowing when to hit the gas, hit the brake, predicting when the lights change, watching the crazy on the road, swerving between lanes, okay? Very much like the market. There's a lot of people driving different cars. They're driving the spot car, the leverage car, the TradFi car, the Roth IRA car, or the full Dex Solana meme coin clown car, whatever you're driving, okay? There's a range of options to look at here. I fear that most people, especially if you are new, are permanently all in and all out on one thing, one allocation strategy, one exchange, one wallet, one address. So this is my plea to those people to hopefully change it up. So for Spot, you have a lot of options on the native crypto side. Kraken being one of them, I'll get to that in a second. This is also tough to discuss because depending where you are in the world, I know a lot of people from all over the world watch the videos here, depending on where you are in the world, you're gonna have different options available to you as far as access. For the most part, the crypto native stuff is available to most people most of the time. The TradFi stuff, it's newer, it's not hooked up around the world yet, but that's also an option for many people. So for Spot, you of course have DCA, you have lump sum, cold wallets, hot wallets, please for all things holy, do not keep everything you own in one wallet on uh, MetaMask or on Phantom, okay? Split it up, split it up on exchanges, split it up on addresses, split it up on cold wallet, hardware wallet, hot wallet, software wallet, at the very least, what that'll get you to do is to separate your strategies. And you can say, okay, I'm going to use this exchange wallet for this type of strategy, this sort of slow burning, slow cooking spot strategy. I'm going to use the software wallets for this high octane lottery ticket lifestyle in Solana. Okay, great. But you save yourself from yourself by not hitting that button because it's, it's fun and easy to hit that button, go all in, and then it's just over. What people do not understand, cannot understand early on is the risk piece because yes, if you would have went all in on a meme coin with everything you had, your entire stack, you could have 10 X, right? But the risk of total loss is a hundred percent. These coins, these meme coins will go to zero. They all will go to zero over time. They've done well on and off here lately, but for the most part, they will all go to zero. Just look at any alt that has ever existed. And it's lifespan, okay? You don't need me to be your nanny here, but that's the reality. So when we're talking about leverage, past spot, everybody loves leverage, right? They love debt, they love leverage. We love credit cards, all that fun stuff. Some considerations for leverage, whether you're on a DEX or a centralized exchange like Kraken, most of the time you have the option for USD margin and coin margin. The difference there being, if you think, let's say two weeks ago or a week ago, we were potentially near a top. We were potentially on more of a 50-50 path for continuation versus reversal. Maybe you'd take a little bit more of a softer approach with USD margin. There are different liquidation levels there. There are different fees and funding requirements for that. But when you're coin margined, you're longing your longs. So if you are in USD terms, if you're thinking in USD terms, which you really should not do in a bull market, you really need to think in coin terms in a bull market because if you've got a long-term target in mind for anything, Solana, 5,000, ETH, 10,000, Bitcoin, 333,000, whatever your long-term target is, bonk, 250, I don't know, right? Whatever it is, you need to be thinking in those terms because you need to be living in the future when you wish you had X coin versus X USD, right? So beyond just using leverage on exchanges, we also have synthetic leverage in the form of alts, miners, on the TradFi side, beta, okay, beta stuff. L2s are beta. Meme coins, mega beta. 
quadruple beta. You're basically leveraging your leverage. And that's how they react, right? But again, back to this idea of risk of total loss. That stuff just isn't for me at any any amount. Some people thrive off of low value bets notionally, collateral wise, with high leverage. That also isn't necessarily my style, but I can see successful people who do that. As far as the alts, you know, it's like lately it's been pretty obvious that it's been Solana and not Ethereum, for example. Most things Solana related have done really well. Most things Ethereum related have not. Most competitive alt layer ones have done quite well, whereas Dino DeFi stuff has not, right? It's been pretty black and white. So if you are in the wrong waste pit, if you're in the wrong pond that isn't stocked, where there isn't attention, there isn't excitement, there isn't constant headlines, there aren't VCs chomping at the bit buying this stuff, whatever, you're probably not going to have a good time. So you definitely have to read the room when it comes to that stuff. Now, the good news is that may change throughout a cycle, right? Intra cycle, that may change. First, it was Solana off the bear market lows. Then it was Solana ecosystem roughly doing very well. That may change to ETH ecosystem later on. That may change to a different ecosystem. I doubt it, but it may change. So you have to constantly read the room there. For the allocation stuff, I'll talk about my personal allocations in a second, but you should definitely be looking at this weekly and just acknowledging if that's the life you want to live, right? Do I want to live a life where I'm denominated in meme coins or something with lesser risk? Do I want to, at this current time, embrace the risk or dial it back, right? Do I have concentrations in one ecosystem, one type of layer two, one exchange? that I need to think about. And custodial risk is a, is a permanent consideration back to this idea of wallets and addresses and exchanges. Hopefully that's pretty straightforward. And then with the tax stuff, definitely not something enough people talk about, but now that we have tax season in a few days here in the U S certainly more people are thinking about that. And, you know, if you burned yourself with running up your tax bill last cycle or the previous cycle, use that, learn from it, maybe trade a little less, maybe trade a little differently. Maybe use a higher time frame, longer targets, take it easy. Then of course, TradFi versus crypto. The benefit to TradFi is the fees. Let's be honest, right? The fees for most of these products are quite low. The fees for trading are is essentially zero versus crypto exchanges. That will probably change over time, but that's one big benefit. Now, one drawback obviously is it's custodial. So IBIT is not BTC, to be fair, it's an IOU for BTC. But I think the important part here is you want to be able to have that optionality. So if you're not signed up for some TradFi exchange or broker that has access to all this stuff, there may be a time when you want to trade CleanSpark, okay? But you've never touched legacy before, but it may be worth your while to think about doing that throughout the cycle. One other way to think about your stack or your risk in USD terms would be hedging. So let's say I think BTC might go to 58. Okay. So one thing you could do is hedge your stack using leverage so that you are net neutral, maintaining your USD value. The bonus here is you're actually collecting funding on that. Now, if you're wrong and we go up, you lose money, right? But at the very least, you're maintaining your USD value. In this case, it is opposite of trend. So you always have to be careful. There's clearly a time and a place for hedging, you know, after a parabolic move, after weeks of a parabolic move, the argument for hedging your stack or hedging your cold wall or something goes up considerably. You know, you don't want to hedge intra-trend from week to week, most likely, most people. But the opposite of this is, of course, just just hodling and doing nothing, right? That's what I do most of the time. Most of the time, I do nothing. Most of the time, it's I've dollar cost averaged in the bear market. I've lump summed in the bear market. And then you do nothing, okay? There's this want for people to overtrade, revenge trade, and you definitely have to fight that and avoid that. Bitcoin, crypto, something that's highly leveraged, all this stuff has massive drawdown potential, massive volatility potential. And if you don't love it at its worst, you don't deserve it at its best, but you do have to protect yourself from getting liquidated on leverage, okay? So you have to save those leverage bets for when you are sure to a greater degree or you have some edge to a greater degree than getting chopped around like we are now. I'll talk about the mean reversion stuff. I've talked about a lot, but 
there are some ways you can mathematically look at where's a level that makes sense based on historical drawdowns, based on 50% retracements, based on moving averages. And I'll hit on the legacy side here for a second because I know there are a lot of guys who, guys and gals, who trade legacy stuff, a lot of Roth or IRA traders out there, HSA traders out there in the US, ISA, I think it's in the UK. Spot ETFs, we know. Why are spot ETFs a big deal? The fees are extremely low. There's no contango or backwardation to deal with. On the future side, the liquidity is generally pretty good. The custodial piece is okay for now, right? It's But it's not SPF level. You're going to lose your money, right? And it's plugged into to the, all these legacy products. As of today, I believe there's two new leveraged spot ETFs for Bitcoin. BitU, which is a 2x leveraged, and then SBIT, which is a 2x short BTC. The difference between leveraged spot ETFs and leveraged futures ETFs would be, again, contango, backwardation, decay. If you look at a leveraged futures ETF, non-crypto, over time, they just trend to zero because of the fees, because of the way futures rolls happen. Like there are, there are issues with these products over time, which is one reason why something like BitX or BTFX from swing tr trade to swing trade is probably great. But as a long-term hold, probably not the best, right? Similar to GBTC at a 2% fee over time. Sure, you did pretty well, but you did not outperform spot, right? Because of those fees. There are also futures ETFs for Bitcoin, for Ethereum, both 1x short and long. For those unaware, Seth is a 1x ETH short for futures. On the Euro side, on the ETP side, they have all sorts of fun stuff that we don't have in the US. These are just US products. Then you've got the mixed futures products. Let's say you want you know equal weight or market cap weighted Bitcoin and ETH mixture. That's also out there. That exists. And then the holy grail for a lot of people, speaking of leverage, would be options on the legacy side. The spot ETFs don't have options yet. That should come probably within the next six months. BitO does have options on the future side. BitX also, I believe, has options, but I'll save that for another conversation in another video. That's a whole new ball of wax. But that's also an option to express an idea or a bet or a hedge, or let's say you want a mixture of cash versus higher risk or higher leverage. And of course, all these are not 24 seven. So that's also something to consider relative to the crypto products. So for me, I've got a mix of a lot of different stuff. This is the non cold wallet, non hardware wallet, whatever you want to think about that. For me personally, my trading stack is split, right? And you've got your, your software stuff, software wallet. You've got your Kraken, in my case, stuff. And then on the legacy side, there's a ton of stuff that I talk about, I look at, I participate in. So it's nice to have that optionality. It's nice to have a foot in both worlds and have exposure to stuff. You know, you've got tons of fintech companies that look good that I talk about all the time. Bitcoin ETFs, energy is a nice little hedge right now with everything literally today on my list red except uh, VIX and DXY. Then of course the miners, which I have a little bit. But for the most part, this isn't going to change pre-Bitcoin having Historically, you are not rewarded broadly for being in alts pre-Bitcoin having Rates are also still very high. So there's a time and a place where it just makes a lot more sense to not be alt denominated for me. Now, some people are going to look at this and say, what are you doing? Why aren't you trading XYZ? And that's fine. That's whatever you want to do is for you. I'm just telling you what I'm doing. This helps me sleep at night. Okay. Being in BOM or WIF. Okay. That just isn't for me. This, I could care less what happens on the spot side. I can live my life stress-free. Okay. <laughs> I'm not worried about total loss with this stuff. Before we get into some more charts here, let me mention today's video sponsor, Kraken Pro. Kraken Pro is a complete overhaul of the Kraken trading experience with a one-stop shop for advanced and professional traders. Kraken Pro enables efficient trading execution across multiple markets with a UI that allows for unique optimization tailored to your trading style. You can check out Kraken Pro with the link in the description of this video. Not investment advice. Crypto trading involves risk of loss. Cryptocurrency services are provided to U.S. and U.S. territory customers by Payward Ventures, Inc., PVI, DBA, Kraken. And speaking of this foot in both worlds, there are products 
like PAX G, which has done quite well, right? Just having this optionality. Now, I didn't trade this. I should have, but I didn't. Um, to trade this, this is a gold stable coin. Is it perfect? No. Does it have a ton of volume? Probably not. Is it hyper liquid? Probably not. It's probably getting better as prices going up here. But just knowing that this stuff exists, at least for me, is half the battle, right? Did I necessarily know that there was a, a leveraged Bitcoin product on the spot side coming? No. Uh, I didn't even know about short Ethereum either, right? But knowing that, that this stuff exists is half the battle. Now, I don't have any insider information, but I think as time goes on here, we will see all of these exchanges live in both worlds, like the Robinhoods, like uh, any other fintech company where you're offered a bunch of different stuff. And the next generation or the newest generation of crypto exchanges, at least in the US, are going to try to offer everything under one roof to their customers. Now that's ideal, right? But if we just look on this list of alts today and, you know, just to dominate it against BTC, let's look. Is there anything, is there anything that's doing decently well? Uh, Litecoin up today, Pax G, Maker, we talked about. Some of this other stuff I don't really care about. Uh, Link doing well, Monero doing well, <laughs> Zcash for some reason, Tron for some reason. But for the most part, almost everything is bleeding against Bitcoin today. And that continues to be the theme week over week. And that's one reason why, for most people who are paying attention historically, pre having, it doesn't make sense to hold alts. This is the total two altcoin index against Bitcoin. And yes, I know there are tons of things that have done really well against Bitcoin. And if you're tactical and select about those things, you're doing great. But what I don't think is smart to do is to just spray and pray on a bunch of alts right now. This is Bitcoin having April 20th, thereabouts coming up. The three-day cloud still bearish, right? So this helps set my own risk parameters just in a second, okay? I don't even, I don't even think about it. It's below the cloud. It looks like junk. Potentially, this is crossing below the three-day cloud. And it just needs more time. It took six months last having for alts to do anything against Bitcoin. So I think that's going to take some time. If we look at the 5200 EMA on the alt BTC index, still a death cross. Now it's getting close to crossing. It's worth paying attention. But am I going to all of a sudden allocate into 25 things once this crosses? No, but I will be a little looser on how I allocate into alts after that, certainly at least also that I buy and hold. But that's one thing to consider when you're looking at risk. And I mean, I've talked about this for a long time. Many people have. Anything that's not Bitcoin typically is beta to Bitcoin. So it performs higher on the upside and higher on the downside. And then there's stuff that just bleed against Bitcoin in general. It's just not their moment. It's not your moment, ETH. Okay. ETH's moment is post having. On trend, we are seeing a death cross on the weekly level. 5,200 death cross for ETH. So we could be pre-down leg here in 2019 still. And I do think we see another down leg. So my risk bells are ringing for this saying, yeah, I don't want any ETH at all beyond what I have for transaction fees. It just doesn't make sense. Why would you want to hold this over Bitcoin? It's losing multi-year support. All the trend metrics are bearish. Talk to me when this thing is back above the weekly cloud or has some semblance of bullishness like it did in 2021. You had a multi-year inverted head and shoulders and you definitely don't have anything like that here that's why i'm always talking about relative pairs because i know there are people out there who are denominated in xyz altcoin so your baseline your north star should always be what is this done relative to bitcoin bitcoin has the lowest regulatory risks it has the lowest risk of going to zero and on days like today and weeks like this week when we have drawdowns typically the drawdowns and alts are 2x bitcoin generally right so if you want to eat that drawdown go for it but just know that you're probably smarter, maybe mixing it up a little bit every now and then, right? Maybe intra-week or week to week, when you reassess your allocations, you shave some off into Bitcoin or you shave some off into cash versus holding your foot to the throttle the entire time and just hoping for the best, right? <laughs> Which is what a lot of people have done. If we want to measure the percent ampli amplification or the multiplication of Bitcoin relative to QQQ relative to gold, relative to ETH, right? All Most of crypto is outperforming QQQ and gold over the past year. Bitcoin most resembling the triple QQQ for 
the past six months, right? It's pretty much followed this green line. ETH, a little lesser degree. So my argument for ETH, again, is it's more risk and is not outperforming yet. That may change, but it is not outperforming yet. You know, where did it lose its its luster specifically was post Bitcoin ETF stuff. So during ETH ETF stuff, this may recouple, but up here, it just doesn't make sense. It hasn't made sense for a long time. Now Solana is off this chart completely in the thousands of percent. Okay. So you should expect more volatility, a bigger drawdown relative to anything else on this chart against Solana. Here's Sol year to date, Bitcoin year to date, ETH, TQQQ, gold, QQQ. Solana best form performer year to date, but again, it has different behavior that's worth understanding, right? And so maybe I don't want to hold that 50x long when I think the rest of the market's looking a little tired. Momentum's calming down or we're getting failed continuation patterns, which is basically what we had this week. If we look at Bitcoin, historic bull and bear market drawdowns, you know, we're clearly in a bull market. We're above the daily cloud. Okay, that's my barometer for being in a bull market. Bear market drawdowns have been between 70 and 80 percent or slightly more. Previous bull market drawdowns have been somewhere between 20 and 30 percent. So if I'm employing a strategy that cannot absorb a potential 20 to 30 percent drawdown or I'm ignoring that, I'm going to get carried off the dance floor. Okay, so you have to know what market you're trading and get ready for the volatility and have a plan. So the cash I have on the sidelines, I would love to add when we are deeper in this drawdown or closer to our mean reversion targets. The weekly 20 moving average has been very good at pointing to mean reversion targets. Now, as I've said before, in 2019 and in 2020, we never actually retested the 20 moving average completely. 2016 and 2017, we tapped it a bunch of times. And thus far, we really haven't returned all the way to the 20 week, which is currently at 51K. So you need a zone at which you are welcoming this dip. Okay. For me, it's between 58 and 51. I'll take anything, anything down there. Fine. Okay. That's my plan. If it doesn't happen, great. I buy at highs, right? And that's it. That's my plan. There's, there's no other thinking involved. If we look at the daily key June also in 2020, never really tapped that till kind of the last leg. We did get super lucky this cycle. We got a full TK crisscross and that's where I employed leverage. That's where you want to save the high certainty stuff. Okay. Options, leverage, whatever. We look at distance from the key June. It was about 30% at the peak. And historically that's about where we tend to either slow down or reverse. That was a couple of weeks back at this point, but up here, we're still kind of in that process in the moment. You know, I was bullish Sunday. The chart looked good. It looked ready to break out. It didn't happen. Now it looks like we're more likely to just slow down and chop around for a bit. Maybe 58, maybe not. Maybe we get moving averages catch up with price. Maybe not. But I'll be ready at 58 if that's the case. And we can look at uh, distance from the key June in 2016 and 2017. And it's the same deal. 30% ish was about the level. And if we're lucky enough in this cycle, we will see several of these resets because that's when you are shifting gears from going hundred miles per hour with 50 X or whatever, taking some off the gas, rotating intra cycle around from alts to BTC and cash, and then getting ready to deploy everything again. Once you get the all clear signal, which would be a bullish TK recross with price above cloud, but we're not even there yet on the daily. And you can do this with Solana. You can do this with any coin. For Solana, it looks like for most alts, we get farther out from the mean reversion targets. This may change from cycle to cycle. Solana's level, I think, is around 155 or something like that. So if you got wrecked or you're getting wrecked or you feel stressed or you don't know what to do, okay, partition the buckets of allocations that you want for yourself. Have your high time frame targets in mind. And if you're in crypto, if you're here watching this video, you have to accept and embrace the volatility, the drawdown. You don't get 200% years without interest cycle drawdowns of 10, 20, 30%. For alts, it could be a lot more, 50% or more. You know, it isn't unheard of to see that for alts. So if you avoid the lottery tickets, 
and you spread it out a little bit, days like today, weeks like this week, certainly don't hurt as much. That's all I have for this one. Like, dislike, comment, share, subscribe, and happy trading.